King, comfort of the spirit, mm -hmm. and the of our president, for us all things, mm -hmm. treasure, blessings, and giver of life. Come and abide us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls with it. So, um, we're going to start sooner than later um, on the book of Revelation. Um, and this is one of the main books that I'm going to be using. It's, it's the commentary on the book of Revelation by Margaret Barker. Um, basically for its uh, uh, contextualizing of the uh, of the whole I'm going to grab another oatmeal cookie while it's there. Mm -hmm. They're really good. <laughs> they are. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, basically for its contextualizing of the of the book of Revelation um and a lot of what she says makes a lot of sense. Now, it's important to remember that there are four levels. The fathers talk about four different levels of interpretation. Um, there's the historical literal, um, which would mean simply the literal meaning of the text. Um, it's historical meaning, what it, what it meant to those who, who wrote it and those for whom it was written. Um, because it was written to a specific group of people at a specific time in a specific place in relation to specific events. And it's important to understand, you know, what were these events which occasioned why and how this text uh, came to be. So there's, there's a historical level. There's, then there's a typological level. And the typological level is very important um, you could also call it the, a sac almost a sacramental level, because the uh, what a type what a typological interpretation does is it ties the text to past events, to present events, and to future events. And so, the text basically um, uh, interprets present and future events. Um, in relation to the past event. So, for example, um, uh, baptism is related to our passing over from death to life, right? You die with Christ in baptism and are raised in him. So it's a type of the resurrection. But it's also a type of Noah and the flood. It's a type of, of the Israelites passing through the Red Sea. It's a type of uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus. It's a type of Jesus' baptism. So there's all these typological prefigurations, but there's also an eschatological um, level. Um, in other words, what does it mean in terms of understanding the ultimate things, the future um, Christ coming back and all the you know all of the eschatological events which um, uh, so it's in that sense um, what it, what it's what it's saying is that these historical events are prophetic in that ter in that sense of the term as predicting the future Prophetic does not necessarily mean predicting the future. And in our culture, we think of it only in terms of prediction of the future. Um, but you also have to remember that the text was written 2,000 years ago, um, almost. And so a lot of what was future for them is past for us. Um, and uh, their present-day present events... Um, for us, are events of the very distant past. So, um, what's most important in the text is, is, or in a, in a typological interpretation, is it's an interpretation of, um, of present and future events 
and the past events in relation to those present and future events. Um, so, um, you know, for example, one of the reasons that Pascha is such a big thing for the Orthodox Church, which is the celebration of Christ's death and resurrection, and especially the resurrection, but it's the whole process of his death and resurrection, not just the event of his resurrection. And not only not only the, the moment of his resurrection, but also his being with us for 40 days and then his ascension into heaven. Um, this is a... Um, uh, this is a past event, right? In relation to us, it's a past event. But there's also a, it's also a prefiguring and a type of the future event in which we also will pass through death into new life and our bodies will be resurrected and we will ascend into heaven um, at the last day. And that's the eschatological dimension. Um, now it's it's really one of the things that um, people get very much hung up on um, is all the symbology in uh, all the symbols and that are in the book of Revelation and try and identify oh Putin's the Antichrist or Trump is the Antichrist or Hillary is the Antichrist or Lenin was the Antichrist, or Mao, or Hitler, or some, and they're all the type of the Antichrist, one way or the other. Um, uh, some more than others. Um, uh, but it, what it, it what it, um, but the text itself does not reveal the identity of. The personal identif- identity of the of the man who the who will be the antichrist, um, and then there's the tradition of the church surrounding all of that, um, which which fills that in. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but that's not the that but that's actually not the real point of the book of Revelation. The real point of the book of Revelation is, uh, at least as it was written was the interpretation of the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 A.D. Um, and the vision of the future kingdom um, is, the, is that which inspired, ultimately inspires hope um, as the ultimate eschatological resolution um, of all of history. So how many years did it... Uh was, was a prophesy or uh, anticipation that like 20 years or 40 years or how long was it? What do you mean? From when he wrote it to when it happened. He wrote about 50 He didn't know. Oh, okay. He didn't know. And um, there was some, there, I mean, there was, there was the idea that it would be soon, whatever that is. Um, but part of the part of the problem is, and especially in our cultural interpretation, is that you know we're looking for all these signs and all of this stuff, and you know just go into an evangelical bookstore or turn on the radio and listen to some of these preachers, and you'd think you'd think that you know that we're in the end times now, and maybe we are. You know, maybe we are. But maybe we've been in the end times since Jesus rose from the dead, and those end times may or may not culminate in our lifetime. We don't know. It wasn't given to Jesus to know. So if he didn't know, how can we know? <laughs> so there's another level of interpretation, which is the moral level of interpretation. And which is pretty self-explanatory. Um, what is the moral lesson of a particular text? Um, and I think it's, you know, there's there's some, uh, you know, there's some very specific moral laws and, and teaching um, in the in the uh, 
in the New Testament and, and in the Old Testament, in the book of Revelation in particular. Um, and then there's other moral teachings that are by implication. And so it's about reading, you know, you have to, you, you derive it from the text as opposed to, um, rather than having it state, you shall do this, this, and this, and you shall not do this, this, and this. Um, so there's the moral level, and then finally there's the allegorical level. An allegory is, is the least hard to pin down. It's the most literary of the, of the, the three type, or four types of interpretation um, because it's dealing directly with text itself um, and, and, um, and what the text uh, can be used for to, usually to symbolize or to explicate a, a lesson for the spiritual life. In other words, whereas um, typology um, is is essentially about the um, interpretation of historical events, past, present, or future, allegory is is the inter- is the interpretation of events in one's own personal s- spiritual history, or in uh, in the spiritual history of a people, or something like that. Um, so you read the great canon of St. John uh, um, of St. Andrew of Crete, which is um, has 179 uh, verses in it, one for every verse of Psalm 118. Um, and you have this extended allegory, allegorical um, use of the Old Testament, primarily, also of the New Testament, which to interpret the uh, the spiritual life, um, just as so and so sinned and of old, so you, my soul, have also sinned in like manner. It's an allegory. Um, Saint Paul uses allegory um, uh, in um, in in his teachings. It's a it's a, all of these are actually scriptural methods. Um, and, they're, and they're within the text itself, um, and they're used by the by the authors of the scriptures, um, both interpreting uh, interpreting the Old Testament, um, or New Testament authors interpreting the Old Testament, as well as um, authors both within the Old and New Testament that um, interpret events using these these various methods, and and using the. Uh, um, uh, the text. So, um, it, it's actually not particularly complicated. You just have to uh, have to be aware of what it is. Um, that being said, um, there's a. What I was thinking to do tonight was, you know, give this kind of very kind of basic. Introduction to um, to the study for the Book of Revelation, um, and and look at uh, look at some of the methods and some of the rather than digging into the text as yet, um, but look at some of the methods, look at some of the uh, 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 historical context, um, and but also look at some of the presuppositions that we have. And one of the things that I'd also like to speak about, because we were do- talking about catechesis, is what are some of the basic presuppositions that need to be um, addressed uh, for people who are uh, in the process of becoming Orthodox? Now, and that's not just in regards to people who are converting and newly, newly looking at Orthodoxy, but also in relation to people who may have been Orthodox for 10 years, and there's still aspects um, of their uh, of their approach to the spiritual life and, and approach to the to theology and other things that haven't quite been brought over the line to the that there's there's still kind of in the West and um, and so it, is that does that sound 
useful? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like for those that have had like an awakening of their Orthodox faith, mm -hmm. maybe that um, I know somebody their parents were nominal, mm -hmm. and so they never went to church, but they were cradle born Orthodox. They were baptized, and then recently they just started thinking about it, and mm -hmm. it was almost like a, an awakening. Mm -hmm. And that can be great. That is great, but and that's primarily a spiritual thing. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily touch the rational understanding. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I firmly believe is that you know, um, if you're raised in this culture, no matter whether you were raised Russian Orthodox mm -hmm. or Greek Orthodox or Roman Catholic or, or Baptist or Evangelical or Presbyterian or something, the American cultural Christianity is some kind of evangelical Protestant uh, that's significantly influenced by Calvinism. Um, and, that holds, and that holds for all of us if we've gone through an American education. Um, and, it, and it takes time um, to understand what are the presuppositions of that um, system of understanding um, and to get rid of them. However, if we've, if we've been a, a kind of a, uh, an active member of, of one church or another, um, say you're an active Baptist or an active Presbyterian or Calvinist or something, um, a Lutheran, then, uh, then there's going to be a much more um, developed paradigm um, of faith and of thought um, that has to eventually be overcome and subject first subject to critique, one's own critique, and then um, then gradually replaced. Often, what happens um, when people uh, begin to confront orthodoxy and they start looking at um, looking at it theology theologically, is that, um, you know, they, they see the, the you know, the um, integrity of the tradition, you know, how ancient it is, how, you know, how faithful it has been over the course of 20 centuries to the apostolic deposit and, and the apostolic tradition, and their paradigm collapses of how they understood faith, Right? And, uh, and this is a very painful thing because it feels like you're, uh, losing, like you're losing faith. Well, you're not losing faith. What you're losing is belief. And there's a distinction between faith and belief. Faith is the knowledge of the heart. Belief is the knowledge of the head. Um, and you can know something with your heart that it's true but not be able to express it because the there are two different there are two different ways of knowing, and there are two different faculties. Now there are some people that are um, so thoroughly integrated that they can express what they know with their heart through uh, with words, but those those people are few and far between when it comes to the higher higher levels of theology. Um, there's another aspect too that uh, um, that there are different types of theology um, that are uh, uh, that that you encounter. One um, in encountering orthodoxy, one thing that most um, certainly most evangelicals and most Protestants and and sometimes Roman Catholics have never encountered is apophatic theology. Um, apophatic theology is um, at the very heart and soul of orthodoxy. It means um, that you can only go so far in rationally explaining God, um, and then you have to stop. And Because we cannot go beyond certain limits. You can only approach the infinite abyss of the divine darkness uh, what, do, what do they call it with a black hole? It's an event horizon. A blue event horizon. 
Yeah. You can approach the event horizon, but you can't go into the black hole um, and ever come out again um, rationally. Um, and in, in a sense, you can say that's what, that's what the orthodox approach to God is. And if you, and if you don't believe me, read St. Dionysius the Areopagite, um, who uh, either was a, um, the disciple of the Apostle Paul in Athens, um, who wrote, um, according to the mysteries of, 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 of the Jewish temple, uh, or the Hebrew temple, which is what certain scholars like Margaret would, um, would advocate, or he was a uh, 6th century non-Chalcedonian who, um, uh, whose works came to focus during the, uh, 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 or, in, or 5th century, uh, during the, after the Council of Chalcedon. So, um, regardless, he's been a central figure in the development of Orthodox theology. Um, and it's precisely a mystical dimension um, of theology that uh, Western theology really doesn't know what to do with. Um, because one of the basic presuppositions of Western theology is rationalism. Um, that everything can be rationally understood, that uh, uh, the human mind is uh, uh, something that is um, almost infinite in its capacity to, uh, to comprehend and to, uh, and to understand and to, and to express. And um, there, you know, different, you know, different philosophies have different understandings of of human capacity, but um, but rationalism basically says that you can understand the entire physical universe. Yeah, but faith cannot be understood. Right, and this is and this is and this is where this is why faith is not um, not part of the rational it's not not, but not they of the still rational have faculty. Faith. Mm-hmm. But they don't rationalize it. Mm-hmm. They can't. Anyway. Right. But starting about the 12th century, there was this whole movement of radical reformation, as it were, um, in Roman Catholicism called scholasticism. And it started with um, the Greek, um, with Greek philosophers or Greek teachers who had been enslaved by the Arabs and brought to Spain and uh, made to teach uh, in, the, in the schools in, in Spain. And what they taught was classical Greek philosophy. Now, they weren't teaching anything different than they had always taught and that their forefathers had taught. And every Byzantine schoolboy um, for in the for every 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 kid in uh, uh, who went to school in the Roman Empire of the Christian Roman Empire would learn Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and all of this stuff, um, but they would get it with commentary, and uh, the commentary consisted of we're Christians we don't we certain texts we don't we don't use you can read them. You can analyze them. That's fine. But these are pagan texts. So um, uh, we, don't un- we, uh, we don't use them in regards to theology. Um, however, uh, these teachers also brought their books, and particularly they brought the books of Aristotle. And um, uh, the, uh, they started teaching them um, and uh, the Western, the Westerners who were their students thought these were the best things since, well, sliced bread hadn't been invented, but um, yeah, the be- yeah the best well no probably the best thing since the fork. <laughs> um, um, 
Yeah, one would hope. Um, and, but they took these texts, and, and with the Arabs, they didn't, they didn't want Christian commentary um, because they were essentially learning uh, through, uh, maybe from the Greeks, but through the Arabs, and the Arabs didn't give a Christian commentary on these texts. Um, and so Aristotelian philosophy got introduced into the West through the Muslims in Spain um, undiluted and, uh, and without commentary. And, uh, and so the writings were disseminated. Um, uh, people in the, new, in the new universities started reading all of this stuff and decided that this would be uh, the ultimate method for doing theology. Now, previous to that, in the, uh, in the first millennium, <coughs> east, west, far east, didn't matter, theolo- the way theology was done um, was, was through the, what in the west came to be called uh, Lexio Divina, uh, uh, divine reading or um, spiritual reading. And what that was, it was a contemplative method of reading the scriptures. Um, and so the, um, so it was essentially scripturally based. Um, all the fathers, all the, um, all, the, all, the, all the clergy knew the New Testament by heart, the entire New Testament. They knew the Psalms by heart. They knew the services of the church mostly by heart. Um, and so they would they would take a text, um, and probably in a systematic way, you know, like we have the daily readings, um, and they would sit down and and use that text as the subject of their prayer, um, and then they would uh, sit with the text and meditate on the text and kind of chew the text and and pray the text and pray about the text, and you know as to what what it was that God was saying through that text to them or otherwise and and then it would take them into contemplation um, into spiritual vision and this was the universal method um, St. Isaac the Syrian writes about it in the 7th century um, in, in Iran is where he ended up living um, uh, and the Greek fathers used it the Latin fathers used it it's kind of a sent you know just the universal method. Um, hello. Okay. Um, and so theology um, was not done in a speculative speculative way. It was done as in a, as a uh, meditation on the scriptures. That's point one, point number one. Another essential point is that when there were the theological controversies, like we talked about in the, uh, um, in the, in the ecumenical councils, um, they were always about a very particular question or a particular issue that had been posed, a theological issue. Um, and uh, it was... Uh, and, the, and the resolution to those questions came out of prayer and contemplation. Uh, in other words, through spiritual vision and, cre- and, and creativity and divine creativity, and we believe led by the Spirit. Um, so this was a very, you know, this was not, a, in other words, it wasn't some kind of systematic, rational program for uh, of uh, of a deductive method of reasoning from the scriptures. I'm sorry, but the father of the church are accepted as well by Catholics and mm-hmm. everybody else. Mm-hmm. So, and they were giving the, their soul mm-hmm. by this way. The mm-hmm. same way. Well, what happened is that that was that was the universal approach during the first millennium. The the mystical approach. In the second millennium, um, they, 
what they did is they took the texts of the fathers and subjected them to um, a deductive method of, of, of reasoning. So if Saint so-and-so said this, and Saint, so- Saint other so-and-so said that, and Saint other so-and-so said this, if A, then B, then C, then conclusion would be D, right? And so the whole thing turned into this this formula of um, uh, of comparing scriptural anal- or of comparing the writings of the fathers, um, and that scholastic method usually uh, and very often it was based on some question from the scriptures, but but then you came but then you came to the development of systematic theology. Um, but who was doing that? Uh, Thomas Aquinas was was the, was the greatest of of the uh, scholastic theologians. And so instead of a theology being rooted in prayer and contemplation, it was rooted in sitting down and analyzing according to certain kinds of principles of reason, of rash of reason. Um, and. And the church, uh, the, the Latin church, became obsessed with uh, the enforcement of orthodoxy. It, was, it itself was losing orthodoxy, but they became obsessed uh, by it. And, uh, and so that's when the Inquisition came in and all of this, all of this kind of stuff. And, it, um, and, and people's um, theological understanding... Was was being analyzed according to all these different, uh, according to these new methods, and the mystics um, who would have these profound spiritual visions um, were persecuted. So, um, Meister Eckhart and and um, the uh, Rhineland mystics in the thirteenth and the fourteenth centuries in Germany. Um, uh, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila who spent huge amounts of time in prison because they were mystics and therefore declared potential heretics and were persecuted by the Inquisition whereas what they were doing is simply being faithful to the ancient method of scriptural analysis and understanding um, and the Protestants, uh, and there were different schools. There were different um, uh, school of Paris, of course, was was the major one. Uh, but there were different schools that grew up all over Western Europe as as Western Europe Im, uh, emerged from the Dark Ages. Of course, part of its emer- uh, uh, um, uh, emerging from the Dark Ages came with. Um, uh, the, the Crusades, and especially in the 13th century, as the Crusaders from the West carried off all the riches of Byzantium, including libraries. And in the meantime, many of the of the highly more highly educated people of um, of Constantinople, um, after the city had been sacked, you know, which meant plundered. Um, went off and lived in the West because it was no longer safe. There was no longer any protection. Um, so Constantinople, in the in the end of the 12th century, um, beginning of the 13th century, had a million people. Um, by the end of the 13th century, there were less than 100,000 people living in the ruins. Um, if you can imagine that kind of destruction, you know, social, political, economic... And ecclesiastical. Um, so, so there are all sorts of currents and things um, in the in the Western Church. Uh, you had two new new kinds of orders, or new or, order of, um, of religious that was, or new type of religious order that was being founded. Two two major varieties: the Dominicans on one hand, and the Franciscans on the other. They're called mendicants. Um, so they were bringing like the eastern kind of view. 
Western. From Constantinople, no? Um, that, some of that happened, mm -hmm. and a lot of it they just kind of blended in because, well, there were exiles and refugees, and so, you know, they lost a lot. Um, just like the Russian exiles and refugees lost a lot of their culture in moving to the West. Um, no, they kept it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so there were all these various schools. There were philosophical movements. Um, uh, and one of, one of those movements was nominalism. Nominalism created a, uh, was a way of understanding which totally changed how people understood the concept of the symbol. The Greek word symbol, <coughs> symbolos, means thrown together. Sim, together, to throw, throw together. In other words, the symbol was what held together two different realities two different types of reality, so that by partaking of the one, you also partook of the other. So in the ancient fathers, um, it was perfectly legitimate to call the sacraments symbols, um, because it, it didn't, it, there was no implication that, the sim, that what the symbol itself was, was not a participation in the reality of both <coughs> so it's bread and wine but it's still the body and blood of Christ it's the symbol that holds together the two realities that is understandable so but with nominalism um, uh, the uh, the idea became that a thing only is it, it can have some kind of uh, referential meaning you can you can have some kind of, um, you can be reminded of something else, but if it's bread, it's bread, and um, it can it, it might to symbolize means um, that it uh, it brings to mind something else, something else like the body of Christ, but it itself is not the body of Christ. Now. This was a radical shift. And so, in, in Orthodox understanding, it's no longer acceptable, given the, the nominalist context, um, to, to say that the bread and wine of the Eucharist is a symbol of the body of Christ, right? It's the, myst it's the mystery, it's the, t it's the type, it's, the, you know, it's all of these things. But we say, and we affirm that it's absolutely the body and blood of Christ, period. Um, this, came, this uh, and so one of, the, one of the reasons they came up with the doctrine of transubstantiation was to get around the whole nominalist problem, um, which said, and transubstantiation says that um, when the priest consecrates the bread of, and wine of the Eucharist, that the substance, the inner substance, is changed, even if you can't see it. Um, but the accidents, the uh, the appearance, remain this remains the same. But that's a, there's a whole lot of philosophical um, gymnastics that you have to go through in order to you know to accept the idea of transubstantiation, right? Well, the Orthodox Church is, uh, does accept transubstantiation, by the way, <laughs> but but we don't we don't have all the Aristotelian um, rationalisms to support that. Um, we just say it truly is the body and blood of Christ. It looks like bread and wine, but it's really the body and blood of Christ. And we're not. And how it's the body and blood of Christ, we can't say because we can't know. Um, it's not with, given to our human ability to understand or to reason how the bread and the wine of the Eucharist becomes the body and blood of Christ. But Jesus said it, I believe it, that does it, you know? Um, 
<laughs> which is kind of the orthodox ar argument. Um, now, this brought all sorts of things into question, this whole nominalist um, idea. And um, so it, it created more debates among the scholastics. Because, and basically, the, monast the monasteries were replaced to a great extent, or the, role, the leading role of the monasteries was replaced by the universities. Um, and so the, the universities became these, these major centers of learning instead of the monasteries. And instead of monks, um, in the monasteries you had mendicants, and especially Dominicans in the universities. And you still have Dominicans in the universities. Um, just right over Catholic University, Dominican House of Studies. Um, the Dominicans are a big teaching order, and they have they have they have schools all over the world. Um, and they were the ones in charge of the Inquisition. Uh, yeah. um, and later, the Franciscans got into that, though that's not how they started. Um, so. But what evolved through this was were, were different schools of thought. And one of those schools of thought became Protestantism. Um, and uh, it combined a whole bunch of different aspects of a kind of a rationalist <coughs> approach in its um, in its theology, and so it start, and so they started to um, to critique Roman Catholic theology. Of course, they were Roman Catholics at first, but then um, with Martin Luther and and all the political, social, economic, and theological and religious chaos that he caused, and then um, uh, others also. Uh, reading what he did uh, followed his lead, you know. So Calvin and and um, and all the various Pro Zwingli and all these various Protestant reformers um, all over central North Central Europe, and uh, essentially with Protestantism, what emerged were several different schools of scholastic theology, um, most of which were. Um, had um, most of which were very critical of the Latin theological tradition, though they still had a lot of the basic presuppositions from Latin of the Latin theological tradition. Um, they were more dualist, uh, like uh, uh, they were very um, uh, juridical. Um, and a lot of that comes from Augustine. Saint Augustine was the uh, was the real father of the Latin tradition. Um, my old professor in, in seminary said that uh, um, uh, Plotinus was a series of footnotes on Plato. That um, Augustine was a series of footnotes on Plotinus. And Thomas Aquinas was a series of footnotes on, um, on Augustine, but it's all it's all about Augustinian theology, and all the presuppos all the basic presuppositions are from Augustinian theology, um, who was who wrote voluminously, uh, but who had certain kinds of temptations. Number one, the whole dualist uh, approach, where things are very black and white. There's another, and this is a, this is a cultural, a cultural thing, um, a an approach in which there's a, uh, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Look, look at my notes. Um, Dualism. Um. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. 
Um, well, yeah, I mean, everything, everything lines up in dualism, good and bad, male and female, all, all, the, all this other kind of stuff. Thank you very much. Another is, uh, it's, there's, a, a, there's a preference for thinking of things in terms of a static state as opposed to a process. So, for example, um, one, of the, one of the great issues, well, you know, the whole, the whole evangelical thing, um, you say your prayer, you know, um, you give your life to Jesus once, you say, you say your, the sinner's prayer, and all of a sudden you're transferred from the damned to the saved. And, um, and, and, that, can, and that can't change, and that doesn't change, and you can't lose your salvation, um, even if you, no matter what. Um, and that's a re- and that's a that's a very uh, strongly held belief, right? Mm-hmm. Very strongly held, and it's but it's some somehow it's rooted deep within our entire culture of um, of our basic common understanding of of reality um, of Western culture. Um, uh, but Jesus said that He saved us. Yes, he did. Exactly. So we are saved. But can you reject it? Yes. So all of these are elements of that basic paradigm. Um now Calvinism, within that, you had um, the major schools, of course, were Lutheranism, and um, and probably the some you know he had a lot of of these essential Augustinian kind of elements, um, and the Augustinianism has got very heavily developed um, coming you know in within Luther, but. Uh, probably one of his biggest things that he developed is sola scriptura and the attitude toward the scriptures. Um, now this is something that's going to be very important for our, book of, our study of the book of Revelation um, because with a, a, a very strict sola, script, uh, sola scriptura um, mode of interpretation um, there's not much room for interpretation of the scriptures there's only what the text says as it says it (coughs) but underlying that is the a presupposition that the scriptures are an external uh, criter- criterion of truth. Um, it's external, it's verifiable, it has absolute authority. <coughs> and uh, depending on the particular version of it, you might be talking about, um, uh, you know, with some, some of the evangelicals, you might be talking about a um, that the King James Version has um, absolute uh, authority and is the truth. Um, orthodoxy does not say that. We don't have an external criterion of truth. And this is very important. Um, because people want something to hold on to. What if you look at if you look at the history of Western Christianity, one of the biggest things, constantly, um, especially in the second millennium, um, was a fight about what is the external criterion of authority and truth. So the first in the first part of the first millennium, but really all the way through, you had the papacy being the external criterion of absolute authority. And uh, and of truth, and then that was 
finally um, reaffirmed in the middle of the 19th century uh, with the declaration of papal infallibility. That the Pope, um, when speaking ex cathedra on matters of faith and morals, um, cannot err. And so his everything that he says in that manner is the truth. But about when you said so is scripture, are you talking about the Old Testament as well as the New? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm so, going to get to that. There is so many contradictions. In, right. So how could? I, no, I'm going to I'm going to get to that. Okay. Um, what was the East reaction? Yeah. So, well, <laughs> no. Um, say no. <laughs> He's not. Um, so, uh, so the part of pro- one of one of the things that Protestantism was was reacting against was the authority of the papacy. Now, histor- historically, in context, um, Protestantism was part of a movement um, that actually started in the 1300s um, in, uh, with the Council of Basel in 1320 uh, called the Conciliarist Movement. And that was where uh, the German princes um, uh, were asserting that um, an ecumenical council has higher authority than the papacy. That the, that the pronouncement the doctrinal pronouncements of the of an ecumenical council are um, have have greater authority within the church and and the and that the pope's authority is limited in regard in re, in relation to an ecumenical council <coughs> in other words um, it takes an ecumenical council to uh, uh, to validate um, a doctrinal statement, like the Nicene Creed, for example. <coughs> now, this was this was the Orthodox understanding. Um, it takes it takes an ecumenical council um, uh, to do certain uh, certain other kinds of make other certain kinds of pronouncements within the church, certain canons and things like that. How, how, how does it? <coughs> How does it work during the council? Do they vote? Do they have a majority yeah. on the um, kind of subjects? The general um, the general hope is that in a, in a, in a council um, there will be consensus, mm. but it uh, usually comes down to a vote. Mm. So it's it's not exactly democracy, but. Um, because the the members of a, of a um, an ecumenical council are all bishops, but um, but the council of bishops has more authority than the pope, who who is the president. And now we see a different you know now we're seeing a different version of this whole um, controversy. But this controversy has been going on for fifteen hundred years. Um, so, um, with sola scriptura, um, the, um, the assertion was that the scriptures are the ultimate, um, and final authority, um, and in, and in the context of the Protestant reformers, at least of Luther, um, as interpreted by the Holy Fathers, by the ancient fathers and the councils. So, in a sense, what Luther was advocating um, uh, within certain limits, you can say that he, what he was advocating was a return to orthodoxy um, of the Western Church. And again, Luther. One of the things that's really important about to know about Luther was that he had no intention of creating a schism. He had no intention of creating a new church. He just wanted to reform the 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 existing church and get rid of the abuses. And so, you know, while the selling of indulgences is probably a great way to raise money, 
I mean, you know, really. I mean, we should we could make a whole lot of money on that. Except we don't have the, and you can't buy you can't buy your way out of purgatory in the Orthodox Church. None of that was a papal idea. <coughs> it was a papal thing. Um, but the popes made a lot of money, and we have St. Peter's Basilica uh, to, as a witness to that, um, because that was built by money from indulgences. And you can still buy plenary, in, you can still buy indulgences from the Roman Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes rational sense. I it mean, makes great sense. There's a lot sense. of scripture to support it. Yeah, hey. How much? It's harder for a rich man to enter into heaven. That's right. And so, and so, if the rich man gives a lot of his money to the church, then he's then he can then he can buy his way in, right? Yeah, there is huh? no guarantee, but because then he's no longer rich, and therefore right. he can go through the eye of a needle. Yeah. So, um, uh, so the sola scriptura thing um, initially was probably not a bad thing. It was a, a return to the essentials of the faith. But the way that it got developed and the way that it got interpreted became very problematic. Um, uh, Because you also had, uh, uh, with Luther and with actually with Calvin as well and the other reformers, um, you always had the idea that the scriptures had to be interpreted by somebody and in and in relation to the tradition, in relation to the um, what was the what was the church's common understanding of of the scriptures, especially in relation to doctrine. Well, the further and further they got away from from the tradition, the further and further they fell away from uh, from orthodox doctrine. Um, and so. Uh, Eventually, this, the scripture itself became this sole criterion in its literal un- interpretation, um, the, the sole, sole criterion of truth. Now, that's very problematic because the scripture has all sorts of, of mutual internal contradictions, um, and there's huge, huge contradictions between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the ch- that's never bothered the church any, because the church has always understood. Well, this is the 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 Bible is a library, where you have many different authors over the course of many different centuries, who've uh, contributed, and then the books have been edited, and and um, you know, and the Orthodox Church has always known that the Jews have radically edited um, their version of the Old Testament. But the Protestants didn't know that. And, um, and so the Protestants decided, um, because they were throwing out tradition and they were throwing out the fathers, you know, the, the early Lutheran period only lasted a short time um, until things got more radical. And then it kind of became make it up as you go along. Um, according to uh, the particular interpretation of the scriptures of the particular group. Um, and so every, uh, every Protestant leader became the, the source of interpretation of the scriptures. And you can, you can see that from the writings of the, um, of the period. Was not, was not the church against the Old Testament to perhaps... No. People not reading the Old The church Testament. was no. No. The church was no the, we've always we've always had the Old Testament. We've always used the Old Testament. So much wrong is that that would lead to all of the splits, all those different interpretations. Eventually, yeah. But the splits didn't that that actually came in America. The the fragmentation of I the, there were there were I don't know, by the time America was um, by the time the United States received its independence, there were probably f- five or six Protestant groups, seven or eight maybe. I don't think many more than that, right? That sounds about right. Yeah. So now, now there were the Lutherans, the Calvinists, the Zwinglians, the Hussites, <coughs> the Anabaptists. Yeah, 
Anglicans. Anglicans. Oh, those were Calvinists. Oh, Calvin. Yeah. So now there's 40,000. 70. 70,000. That's growth. It's gross, yeah. <laughs> and, it's schismatic growth. Right. And so, with, with sola scriptura, which really means, um, you know, well, the, another thing that also developed in this was, you know, at first it was, it was, it was the interpretation of the leader. So, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin, you know, all these, they had their own interpretations and people would follow their interpretations and still do sometimes. You know, how many, as Lutherans, how much, how many times did you read Luther? Or Calvinists, did you, did you read Calvin and, and his, you know, his interpretations? But then, it, um, but then the principle of individualism developed in the 18th century and that, um, and what eventually became kind of enshrined as the uh, as a basic principle in American uh, culture is that each person can interpret and understand uh, scripture on his own. Um, and this was this was really beginning in the nineteenth century. Um, it was otherwise it was communal, um, but in the nineteenth century it became very individualistic. And that's when when the when it fragmented. Mostly in America. Starting in America, mm-hmm. and then it, then then the disease crept elsewhere, mm-hmm. all over all over the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so that on one hand, you have the idea that the scripture is is the absolute criterion of truth, and on the other hand, it's all relative. And which leads to, there is no truth. And and that's exa- and that's, you know, and that's what part of what things came to, starting in the 18th century, you know, was the development of atheism, and um, um, so forth. Now, there's other problems that came out of sola scriptura, um, which really. Um, uh, it, you know, it really um, radically constrained um, um, one's ability to enter into the text. And so, for example, um, uh, if you if you take the if you take the Protestant version, of, you know, the, like the King James version, which was just the kind of universal Protestant version of the uh, of the Old Testament up until the past twenty, thirty years, um, uh, you may or may not know, you may or may not realize the kinds of um, radical radical differences there are with uh, other versions of the scriptures. For example, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the Septuagint version, which reflects a, f- a much older uh, version of the Old Testament. Septuagint was translated from gr- into Greek in, two, in the 270s BC, whereas the Masoretic text uh, reflects um, the first half of the first millennium um, after Christ. So the text is probably that it reflects is is maybe three is three at least three to five hundred years older than what is in the Protestant version. When the um, when the uh, um, one of the things that the Protestants did in rejecting tradition, because along with the sola scriptura comes the rejection of tradition. Um, is that they decided that they needed to recreate Christianity, and so they looked at the at the uh, synagogues that were there in Germany, and in Switzerland and in France, and they um, uh, replicated 
to some degree, or they based their uh, idea of what early Christianity was on the Judaism of 16th, 17th century um, Central European uh, Ju- uh, Judaism. <coughs> not realizing that not only had the Jews radically uh, altered the scriptures, but they also had, um, but Judaism had grown and developed over the course of the centuries, and so it was very different than it had been, you know, fifteen hundred years that earlier. Is called the Reformation? What's that? Is that called the Reformation? Yeah, this was the Reformation. Mm. So it really was a reformation. Mm. Of the church, and not just a not just a um, uh, an editing out. You, you you've got the reformers like like Luther, which ba- which, which basically kind of um, he he cut some corners, and he and he you know, um, but it, but it's rec- Lutheranism is recognizable to Roman Catholicism, traditional Lutheranism. Modern Lutheranism is not, but. But traditional Lutheranism pretty much is. Um, but then you got these groups, and especially the Anabaptist groups, that that uh, reformed according to their own ideas and based on these various other historical precedents. Now, some of that was more accurate than others. Uh, and some of it was uh, worked better than others. Um, and so... But um, you, all of these groups were, were essentially doing their own thing, and so they began to separate further and further and further from one another. Um, there was, at the, time of, um, at the time of Luther, there was no such thing as denominations, there was uh, there was the church under Lutheran under under the leadership of Luther and his people. There was the Roman Catholic Church. There was the church under the influence of Calvin and his people, and of Zwingli and his people in Switzerland. You know, just in different places. But these were not different denominations, and you wouldn't go into a town in Europe and find a Catholic church, a Lutheran church. Um, a Calvinist church and a Zwinglian church on the four corners. First off, because they'd kill each other. Um, uh, uh, but well, but for, first they'd all kill the Anabaptists, and then they'd kill each other. Um, it was called the Thirty Years' War, um, and uh, there was there was no concept of religious pluralism. Each state. And in Germany, these were little; these were small. The states were small. You know, they were city states basically. Followed the religion of its prince. So, if the prince was a faithful servant of 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 the pope, he and his and his uh, whole realm would be Roman Catholic. If he liked Luther, they might be Lutheran. If they if he liked Calvin, they would be Calvinist. But um, there was. It wasn't until the sixteenth, mid sixteenth century, um, that they would tolerate. No, no, it wasn't until the seventeenth century that they would tolerate having churches of other interpretations on their own territory, uh, because there was no concept of religious pluralism: one state, one church, one society, one prince, one hierarchy. Um, and that's where the and that's one of the reasons the Anabaptists caught it um, from everybody else is because they didn't conform to that rule, and they refused to submit um, to this kind of state church idea. Um, and they also they also did things like um, rebaptized a- anybody. Um, Whereas all the rest of those churches were horribly offended if if somebody would rebaptize their people. Um, so uh, all this all this created this um, this mess, which then began to 
essentially fragment. Um, but without a criteria, but without um, even though even though all almost all the Protestant groups believed in the authority of the Bible, they all interpreted it differently, mm-hmm. um, and there was no common interpretation. Um, and after after the um, into the early seventeenth century, uh, most of the Protestant groups uh, actually dropped the Nicene the. Well, many of the Protestant groups dropped the Nicene Creed. When was uh, this again? When, when, when was this again? Um, around the year around the year sixteen hundred. Okay. So, Luther's Reformation was in um, fifteen nineteen, or he began the Reformation in fifteen nineteen. So. Um, that's why they just. Or maybe it was 1518. It just celebrated the 100 years of Deformation Day. Um, and, uh, but did they interpret the Bible in the church? I mean, the Old Testament. The Bible was, well, all this also coincided with the, the advent of the printing press. And so people could have, finally have Bibles. <clears throat> and churches, could not even, up until the printing press, not even all churches would have a whole Bible. Because the Bible was very expensive. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't exactly fit into a nice little folio, you know. It, it, you know, Bibles, Bibles could be huge, would, or multiple volumes. But with the printing press, they began to to shrink and and people could actually own them and individual churches would actually own them. And that was part of the reason why people could also start reading them uh, because you didn't have to go to the church and, and, you know, and get permission to read the sacred book. And also education was expanding. Um, You know, in the, in the 16th century Europe, I don't know, Probably no more than ten percent of the population could read. I would expect. Is that, that's about right, isn't it? About ten percent. Yeah. So. Um, so there's lots of different factors, you know, that that went into all of this. Um, so what the bishops were discussing was had nothing to do with the population that couldn't even read with the people I mean when you have the council you have the bishop that decides something <coughs> and who understand that and who knows about it well I mean we didn't have internet you know, no they didn't no internet no Google, no Google, no, Google. No Google News <laughs> no TV no phone nothing not even Fox News, <laughs> you know. Or you fake could news. hear some stories <laughs> from your neighbor. That's all. Right. Um, so, one of the things that eventually evolved uh, in relation to sola scriptura is the idea that. Um, the the text can um, only can only be understood as literally true. In other words, only the literal interpretation <clears throat> of the text is correct. Um, that would mean, as long as there's a moral teaching, um, it, it's stated. It's a moral. That's fine. You know, a, a typology where it says that it's a typology, you can understand it that way. Although in the West, typology began to fall away. Um, about the time of the Reformation, and it's and it's almost lost in the West right now. They don't even think that way. And allegory, the West never understood allegory in the first place. Um, it was, and that remember allegory that was that was the big thing out of out of Alexandria, and um, and a lot of the East was deeply influenced by it. But the West, you know, for most for most of the history, um, from the from the f- Council of Chalcedon, 
all the way up until um, the Counter-Reformation in the 16th century, the West was in social, political, and economic chaos. And not only could very few people read, but they were more interested in finding out where their next meal was going to come from, you know, than arguing about some obscure theological points. Um, some of the clerics, on the other hand, had um, all sorts of, uh, you know, they had all sorts of free time. Um, and so when you, when you get this literalist interpretation of, of the New Testament, um, and especially since um, either only the pastor knows for sure, or, or in those churches where each individual interprets the scripture for himself, um, you get all these multiple conflicting interpretations. And here again, where is the criterion of truth? It's gone. Um, and so I personally think that the current situation in our culture in which um, truth, the, the, in which the assertion is made that there is no truth, that each one has their own truths, um, which, is no, which is nonsense, it's philosophical nonsense, um, is a product actually of, of this, whole, this whole process that began with the Reformation. Um, the relationship of you me him with God is individual. And it and and all the relationships are individual. And so another thing that came out of this is um a, an a historical approach in with Protestantism is an a historical approach to religion. If the saints don't matter, if the interpretations of the saints don't matter, if the development of the doctrine doesn't matter, if if, and all this history doesn't really matter because it's all about me and God. No, there is the That's relation that I have with God it? has something to do mm. with what I know. No? Yes. Say that again? I mean, the, my relationship with God has something to do with what I know, mm -hmm. what, what I've learned, what the tradition was, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of connections. Right, but the Orthodox understanding is that our relationship with God it also depends on one on our relationship with one another and our relationship to the church and our relationship with the saints and and our understanding that um, all of those who've gone before us in faith have shown us the way they've they've laid out the path that this is what you need to do to be saved this is the way that you need to walk in order to, to work out your salvation. Yeah, but that's the rules. No, it's not, it's not just rules. It's, it's an example of, of a life. But if... Um, and, they, and they intercede for us, and, and they're present with us, and, and we understand that, um, and it's our experience of the presence of the saints with the church. Um, that's why we have, that's why we have relics in the church. You know, we don't see it so much in this country, a, a couple places, but uh, you know, you go to the old world and they have um, whole bodies of the saints in the church. It's not just a little chip. And so you're standing among the saints. You go to San Francisco. There's Saint John laying under glass. And you can see him, you know, his hands crossed on his, on his chest, and, and he's present with you at liturgy. It's pretty awesome. See the skin. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see that it's okay. there's a person there. Skin on his hands. And... But the ahistorical, this ahistorical understanding that is that's classic to America and to American not only religion, but American culture, um, we're, it's like we're, we're kind of adrift and not knowing where we are, 
in relation to the rest to the rest of the world. And in fact, it doesn't really even matter if it's just me and Jesus. So. But America was first uh, not organized, but the people that came here mm -hmm. were from the old mm -hmm. world because of uh, religion problem. No. Right? They oh, in like Massachusetts. They were like dissidents. So, well, some were. The ones in Massachusetts were. But the main colony was actually Virginia, it wasn't Massachusetts. Pennsylvania, no? No, the main colony, the main English colony was, was Williamsburg, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the main Dutch colony was New York. Mm -hmm. And so you had, you, you had the, these random groups of uh, schismatic dissidents, religious dissidents called the Puritans, landing up in, up in, up in New England, pro probably because they probably weren't welcome in Virginia. <laughs> Um, because when the when the when the English came to Virginia, they established the Anglican the A Anglican Church was established. That's why you see all over Virginia Episcopal churches everywhere. A everywhere. <laughs> it, it's because by law you had to be an Anglican, mm -hmm. <laughs> just like in England. So um, where they also had. Didn't up until I mean, when was it in England that probably the 18th century that um, uh, that they tolerated multiple denominations? I would bet 18th century, right? I think it was the Elizabethan Compromise that established a, sort of a freedom of religion. Well, was it, was it freedom of religion, or was it freedom for the... Freedom from the persecution for your religion, but the, the state was still uh, Anglican. Okay. So it was 17th century. <clears throat> but how many denominations were there in England at that time? There was, there was the Anglican Church, there was the Roman Catholic Church. Quakers. There were the Quakers. That's about it. <laughs> and Calvinists. Except the Anglican Church were Calvinists and Calvinists were... And Anabaptists. A few. Hmm. Not many. The Anabaptists are the, the ones that don't believe in baptism? No, they believe in, re, in... that it has to be adult baptism. Adult baptism. You can't baptize children. Oh. And babies. Right. Believer baptism. So I have a question. Uh -huh. With with the doing away and where it's getting down to just our relationship with Jesus concerning the Protestants, mm -hmm. is that where everything becomes relative? It's whatever that person believes. And I don't know enough about relativism to really know. Rel that's that's really not about. That's not what. Normally, you wouldn't talk about relativism in, in relation to that. Okay. Relativism is more a philosophical thing where everything means there is no criterion of truth and everything means the same thing. And so um, it's all the same God, you know. Uh, it can be a, a Orthodox or Catholic or or Muslim or a Buddhist or all the, it's all it's all the same really right that's a relativist attitude I'm not sure that's relative from like my how would you explain it I thought it was more cultural and moral relativism both historical and cultural well there is there is I mean, what you're describing sounds more like uh, universalism, especially like Unitarian universalism. Well, and that essentially is yeah. that essentially is how universalism regards religion. There's moralism in relation to mm -hmm. religious choice, but then relative or relativism in re regards to religious choice. But mm -hmm. but there's moral relativism, which means basically you can do whatever you want, right? I mean, based on 
society at that time period in the region, you know, judging whether it's, you know, evil or not evil. Like a lot of Old Testament stuff, it's, um, they use relativism to explain why it's not as bad as we see it today or whatever. Well, yeah, it's all relative to the. I mean, there's there's arguments that it's all relative to the to the context, yeah. the historical yeah. context. But it's not like just randomly, like like it's based on criteria. Well, yeah, some, I mean, yeah. something like that is. But then yeah. there's then there's also this. I think there's a cultural, a, yeah. a contemporary cultural usage of that idea that it basically, there is no truth and everything is, yeah. just whatever you. You, you do whatever you want, and it's all the same. That's pro- I, I'm not. I'm not expressing it very well. I, I kind of understand. I see that more universalism, like specifically. I guess relativism is more broad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, to to wrap up. There's all these various trends that have have created um, relativism, that have created uh, a lack of criterion of truth, but have also created a presupposition of a um, that the script that the the scriptures have to be interpreted in a, in a literal fashion, and um, that. Uh, that somehow it's an external criterion of truth by which all other truths are judged. Um, and the problem, the problem being that um, it's, uh, it's relative to the particular um, theologian or particular speaker mm-hmm. as, to, as, to, as to who's making, who's making that interpretation. Um, so as but so as we approach the book the book of Revelation, um, it's really important to understand that we're dealing with a very complex historical context. We're dealing with a text that has a, that has a very very complex history, um, and that there's almost nothing in it that can be taken at face value. Um, one of the biggest problems with the interpretation of the book of Revelation is people trying to take it all at face value and then interpret it from there in some, in some strange way that has very little connection to the text. You know, so all of these, these, these wild interpretations of, you know, um, Russia is going to invade Israel and, and all of this other kind of stuff. and It's all nonsense. And the rapture <laughs> theology, you know, which is, which is an overly literal reading <laughs> of certain areas, and then an ignoring of certain other areas, which usually goes along with, you know, a literal interpretation because you can't have a literal interpretation of mutually contradictory <laughs> elements. So what is the rapture? The rapture is um, the idea that uh, we. Uh, that all of the dead will, or all of those who are living, will be taken up uh, into heaven, um, depending on the, and depending on the context. Um, uh, if you're a, if for a, a, what is it, a premillennial, uh, premillennial, a premillennial, <laughs> that the rapture will be before, or no, a pre-trib, it, that will be before the great tribulation. And which means that the church will not have to suffer, uh, because God will take the church up into heaven uh, before the tribulation, and so that's where you see the, you know, the um, pre-tribbers. Yeah, well, that's where that's where that's where you see the, you know, like these movies on um, Left Behind and things like that, where they where they're saying that oh, you know, airplanes will fall out of the sky and you know, and cars will go instantly go driverless and all of this kind of stuff and you know, um, clothes will be left behind. Yeah, uh, all they'll be left, <laughs> all they'll be left is clothes. You know, sitting in a pile of clothes, and 
banished. Um, so that's 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 one style, and then there's another another the post trib um, is that the church will have to go through the great tribulation, and then um, then only at the end when uh, when Jesus returns will there be the rapture and and all the believers will be taken up. But first they have to go through the trial, and so. Um, uh, you can have a lot of theories about. Oh yeah, and 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 and, and, the, and, yeah, and these are all theories, and they're not the doctrine of the church, and they're not the doctrine of the fathers, and they're not the interpretation of the fathers. Um, Just within the last what hundred and fifty years? Yeah, and the whole thing came up about hundred and fifty. The whole rapture theory came up about hundred and fifty years ago. Um, one of the things that's very important to understand is that the historical context is very important for the church. And, um, and our own consciousness of history, I, how can you not, if, if you're going to the Orthodox Church and you're, you're hearing about all these saints and you're hearing the, um, hearing the hymnography and matins and vespers and, and reading the Synaxarian and the lives of the saints, you're hearing about the lives of saints from the past 2,000 years. And um, you're hearing about people whose, um, whose work was, who, who influenced the life of the church over the past 2,000 years and the whole history of, of how things developed over the past 2,000 years. And so, um, for, you know, for an Orthodox or Catholic Christian, um, you have a... Re- uh, you have a sense of history and your place in history, whereas in an a, in a, like an American cultural context, we have we have kids who don't know that there was a Second World War. We have kids who don't know that there was a Vietnam War. You know, I, it's 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 wild, much less. You know, the, you know they ask ask them who Abraham Lincoln was, and maybe they can tell you that, but. He was some old president, you know. Um, who must have, anyway? Um, <laughs> who must have been a Democrat, right? Because he <laughs> freed the slaves. Um, but um, they'd like to think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, and so that's there's an interesting history there. But for us, it, it's very important, and and so as you and we as we get into the Book of Revelation. One of the things that we have to understand is that um, history was very, very important for the people who, the, for the intended, for the audience of, of the Book of Revelation and the audience of the Scriptures, um, and that the the book itself is, to a great extent, an interpretation of history, um, and and it's a. And it's a it's a spiritual interpretation of history, um, and it's not necessarily about predicting future events. But the prophetic element, in other words, um, the the spirit inspired element, is is giving that spiritual um, inspired understanding of what of of what the what the real eternal and divine significance of past events were and of how these how it might first how it might prefigure future events um, You know, there's uh, there are other elements too that were very important for coming out of the Reformation. Um, um, not only the rejection of traditionalism and the rejection of tradition, but the rejection of liturgy, and even the idea of what liturgy is, and and of what worship is. You know, so you get you get our common um, American under- idea that. Uh, um, the early church was like a, a Baptist Bible study where you all sit around with a guitar, say a few songs, sing a few songs, and then talk about um, what what a particular scripture means to me, with the accent on me. And each person goes around and talks about what they think it means. Well, or you get 
or you get a leader who, who tells them what it means in his opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's... Um, and then they sing a few more songs, and you know, and and then that, and then that's it. And if they're charismatic, they'll speak in tongues or something like that. But um, dance, oh yeah, whatever. Um, that's, not, that's not bad. No, it's not bad. Not bad. But or it's if a. If it was just a Bible study, but it's not worship. I mean, how, right? How, how, how do the Protestants deal with the Book of Hebrews? Well, that's that's very prob- that's very problematic. <laughs> um, it's very problematic, and um, I don't think they, I don't think they have a clue, quite frankly. Um, they skipped that book. So what about the Book of Revelation? Well, the Book of Revelation is is uses all this liturgical symbolism, yeah. and u- liturgical images, um, and and it gives a kind of a. It's it itself presents a typological. Um, it itself is is a kind of antitype of what the of what the liturgy is supposed to be. It's a, in other words, it's a it's a prophetic vision of of the liturgy, just like in just like um, you had glimpses of it in in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in Daniel, in you know in Ezekiel. Which was the time of the second temple or no more temple? The, the revelation. It was the time of the second temple, um, uh, but some of the aspects of the Book of Revelation go back to the first temple. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <coughs> so John is caught up in a vision for a certain purpose, right? And it's this uh, kind of a declaring of, of this whole um, future. Also, the uh, things that are going on in the church, and so. Well, in a sense, yeah, he's interpreting. He's interpreting the events, events, so that people can um, take heart and not and not lose hope. Um, but then there's other, you know, then there's then there's other elements that are that are that are in there, because on one hand, it's a revelation to John. But, but it's the revelation of Je- it's the revelation of Jesus. It's the visions that Jesus saw, and that were the visions that were the um, foundation of his ministry, um, which is, which is which were shown to John, and that's that, and that's basically the first part of the, the first part of the first chapter. It's the rev. Does have the text in it? Some text. How does it open? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show his slaves that things there is need to come to pass quickly. He gave a sign and sent forth his angel and his slave John, who bore witness to the word of God. Mm -hmm. So, let's think about what that actually says. (laughs) The revelation of Jesus Christ... er, Say, say, quote the, uh, a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show his slaves what things there is to there is need to come to pass quickly, and he gave a sign, having sent forth by his angel to his slave John. Okay, this this was the revelation to Jesus, which Jesus then showed John. But it was the revelation to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And we don't really think about that, you know. We, th- you know, we jump uh, straight ahead. And I was to I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and it's John talking, which means I was in church on Sunday, you know. And um, but we, 
What? I saw the lion. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but these are but these are these are the visions that Jesus saw, or that Jesus received, which he shared with John. Mm-hmm. So so that so that people would have hope. Um, so we'll go into all of that. Now, this is um, sometimes that version of the Bible is just in, unreadable because it's um, uh, it's so literalistic. What version is that? That's the that's the from Buena Vista, Colorado. Yeah, the Orthodox New Testament it reads like somebody's Greek homework. And and part of that, um, I will end here, is because the, uh, um, um, at least Margaret Barker's theory, is that it was originally written in Aramaic, Hmm. and is translated. And evidently it has I don't read Hebrew I don't I, I should I need to learn that's a big step for somebody who's my age um, but it's a um, uh, it's full of Hebraisms just like the Gospel of John is full of Hebraisms um, in other words Hebrew turns a phrase and and uses which sometimes work when you, you, in translation and sometimes they don't. So, so does, was this clear tonight? It makes sense? Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll, we'll start digging into the text next week. <laughs> um, or at least into the background for the text. And so... And so that we'll talk about the temple, and we'll talk about the uh, the priesthood. Mm-hmm. Next week, could you um, lay out the Orthodox eschatology, mm-hmm. or just touch on it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Unless it's out of sequence, and that's something you're saving for later. Well, it would be a little out of sequence. Oh, well, it's way. But. Um, but I mean, very briefly, it would be. I could, could do that briefly, and remind me. Um, so. Uh, would you want to announce that in twelve days the uh, service in Gainesville? Oh yeah, talk about the Gainesville thing. Uh, Father uh, Father Nectarios is going to be is starting a mission out in Gainesville. Um, he, uh, look at the uh, I. I sent Barnum, so I sent you the uh, link or the forwarded that. Um, it has the address on it. Father Victor sent out a uh, an announcement. So twenty after Sunday, of January. Yeah. yeah. So the day after Theophany. Um, so for those who live out there, that might. Where is it? It's a head north of Warren. It's 66 and 29. Mm-hmm. So uh, I read that letter that was emailed to all of us, and I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> well, um, do you know? Okay. Not that I need to know. It was kind of in code. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, Father Nectarius uh, came to us from the uh, Carpatho Russian Church, which is part of the Ecumenical Patriarchate.